Thank you very much and welcome everyone to this session, a deep dive into Docker. That's it for the slides. This is a demo only session. So let's jump straight into, hello, let's jump straight into VS Code. And my name is Andrew Prusky. I'm a SQL Server DBA, Microsoft Data Platform MVP and certified Kubernetes administrator. If you have any questions after today, please feel free to contact me on Twitter at DBA from the cold or DBA from the cold at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. So today we are going to do a deep dive into Docker. So we're not just going to run some containers. We're going to go a little bit further into the Docker platform. So it's going to be things like talking about container isolation, container networking, persisting our data. Then we're going to have a look at building our own custom images. And then we're going to have a look at Docker Compose. Uh, the first thing to mention is all the code for the demos I'll be doing are available on my GitHub. And I'll post a link to that repo at the end. But there it is. And there's a link to when I do this session with slides, there's some slides as well that go with it. And that's all on the GitHub repo. But let's dive in and let's have a look at container isolation. Now, when I talk about containers, I say containers are an isolated environment that contain all the necessary binaries and libraries required by a piece of software so that it can run in the same manner regardless of its environment. But how is that isolation achieved? Well, it's achieved through three main concepts, constructs and limits. So we have namespaces, control groups, and changing the root of the container. So let's start having a look at those, starting off with control groups. And all control groups do is limit the amount of resources on a host that a container can run. So let's run a container. So we're gonna start off with Docker container run as usual. We're gonna map some ports. So here we're mapping port 15789 to port 1433 within the container. And all that's doing is saying anything in the host on port 15789 will be mapped into the container on port 1433 the port that SQL Server listens on, and we can connect from outside our container into SQL running inside the container. Now here, we're going to limit the memory available to this container. We're going to limit it to two gig by using this dash dash memory flag. Then we're going to accept the end user license agreement, which we always have to do when we run a container, set an SA password, give our container a name, and then specify the image we want to build our container from. And here I'm using the 2019 CU5 image. I want to mention this. I'm using this dash dash memory flag, and that's going to limit the amount of memory available to this container. And it's going to do that in the background by creating a control group that's going to drop this container in. And that's how the memory is actually limited. So let's run this container. Dr. Container run. Again, a warning about swap capabilities there, but don't worry, that's just because of the VM I'm running on. So let's have a look to see if that container is running. And we say docker container ls dash a. The dash a is to show all containers, no matter what state they're in, because by default, ls will only show running containers. So there we go. We have a created 17 seconds ago and the status of up, which is all good. I don't particularly like this for demos. It's all cramped. We can't really see what's going on. There's the name there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to format that output. So I'm just going to use this by using this format flag and this statement here. And there we go. Makes it a little bit nicer. We've got the name, the image the containers from, its status, and the ports that are mapped. OK, in real life, not so much usage, but it's great for demo. So I'm going to be using that. Oh, OK, so our container is up. Let's grab that container ID. There we go. And now we can have a look at all the control groups that were created for that container. And there's a whole bunch of them, but the ones we're really interested in are memory and CPU. So let's dive in a little bit further and let's have a look at that memory control group. Let's get the memory one and let's get the CPU one as well. Why not? There we go. That's where they live. So now I can grab that memory limit and it's in bytes. So if I divide it by 1024 a couple of times, there is our memory limit being set by the control group that was created for that container because we use the dash dash memory flag. It's memory 2048 megabytes, so two gig. So I'll have a look at the CPU limit. Now that's set to minus one because I didn't use the dash dash CPUs flag when I spun the container up. So that is unrestricted. That container can use all the CPU on the host. But what we can do is we can set the CPU limit to a container on the fly. And I'm saying thank you to Anthony Nocentino there, because I always thought you had to shut down the container 
update it, and then spin it back up to uh, enable that limit. But you can do it on the fly while the container is running. So let's do update SQL container one, CPUs two. We're going to limit this container to two CPUs. There we go. And now if we have a look, we can see that it's set to this 200,000, but that is basically setting it to two CPUs. OK, so that is control groups. By using control groups, Docker can limit the resources available to a container. And this uh, prevents the noisy neighbor syndrome, where you get one container taking all the resources on the host and starving all the other containers on the host of resources, and their performance could be affected. So when you're running containers on a host and you're running multiple containers, always remember to set your CPU flag and your memory flag. OK, right. So now let's have a look at something called namespaces. If control groups control what a container can use, namespaces control what a container can see on the host. And it'll have created a whole bunch of namespaces here. We're going to go through all of them. We have the mount. We don't want the container to see the same mounts as the host. UTS, Unix time sharing system namespace. Sounds complicated, but all it really does is change, is allow the container to have a different host name than the actual host it's running on. We have inter-process communication namespace. So process on Linux can share the same memory and access the same memory resources. We typically don't want containers to do that, so they go in their own IPC namespace. PID, process ID namespace. We'll have a look at that in a bit. The container is in its own process ID namespace, and we have network as well. OK, let's have a look at the host name of my Docker host. It's called Docker. I'm unimaginative. I called my Docker host Docker. But let's have a look at the host name within the container. And so we use docker exec. And what this will do is run a command against our container. So we say docker exec, our container name, and then the command we want to run. So I'm going to say host name. And there we go. Container has a different host name than the actual host that it's running on. And that's because it is in its own UTS, Unix time, Unix time system sharing namespace. And that namespace allows that to happen different host name than the host it's running on. Let's have a look at the processes that are running in the container. So we say docker exec ps orc, and this is going to show the process of running within the container. That's all the processes that are running. The container can only see its own processes and the command that I've just run against it, because it's in its own process ID namespace. And so if I look at the host, we can see those processes there. All containers are, are processes running on the host. That's all they are. So a container doesn't actually exist. It's not an actual thing. They're just processes running on the host that are in control groups, namespaces, and have their root change. And we'll have a look at that in a second. So we can see here, they have a different PID, process ID. And that's because they're in the process ID namespace, the PID namespace. You also see the user here is different. It's not technically, that's the ID of this user, but that user doesn't exist on my host. It only exists within the container. And that's why we're getting an ID instead of a username. So let's grab that PID. And what I can do is by using NSEnter, I can actually jump into the namespaces of that container, and then I can run the host. There we go. So just by doing that, I can jump. don't even have to use Docker exec. I can use NSEnter, jump into the namespaces, and run the same command and get the same result. And I can check the processes running as well. And there they are, bash is me, PS exec is me, and then we've got the SQL server processes. And we can see that they're running as the MS SQL user. Okay, so that's namespaces. So control groups, controlling what the container can use, and namespaces, controlling what the container can see. Now, you may have noticed it's running as an MS SQL user. There is another namespace called the user namespace. And what this allows is for users in the container to be mapped to different users on the host. Now, by default, Docker doesn't implement this. So if we run a container from a custom image, which runs SQL as root, we'll have a look at the processes running on the host. Now, this is a custom image here that I've built. It's all available on my GitHub, And all it does is run SQL as root. That's the only difference. But if we just run this, and then we have a look at the processes on the host, we can see that the process on the host is running as root. So these are our processes within our container, and they're running as root on the host, which isn't great, to be honest. This could allow processes in the container to get 
access to things on the host that they shouldn't be able to. And this is one of the main reasons Microsoft switched from running SQL as root to running SQL as that customer MS SQL user, uh, I think at the start of maybe the end of 2017 images, the start of 2019. But if you have a look at 2019, they'll all be running as that MS SQL user. And this is one of the reasons why, to prevent it from running as root on the host and therefore maybe getting access to the host that it shouldn't be getting access to. So that's control groups, namespaces. Let's have a look at changing the root. If I create a database in my first container here, now we are using the MS SQL CLI here. If you haven't checked it out, it's really good. It's like SQL command on steroids. It does some really cool things like gives you IntelliSense and stuff like that. I highly recommend you check it out. But there we are, we've created our database. And then if I go into my container, so Docker exec container, and then I'm running this command, ls.al against this location, there are my database files in this var op MS SQL data. So that's from the root of the container, var op MS SQL data. But if I have a look at those files on the host, so running the same command just on the host, ls var op MS SQL data, that location doesn't exist. This is because the container thinks these files live here, but that's because the root of the container is changed when it starts up. So what we can do is run this command and actually have a look at where those files are on the host. So they're actually under this location here. So now I can do lsal against that location. And we should be able to see a var, there it is. So if I do that location and var opt ms SQL data, that's where the files actually are on the host. So this is one way of restricting what the container can see. The container can't see outside its changed root. It can only see up to that slash var opt MS SQL data. And it thinks that's the root of the host, but it's not. It's just what the root of the container has been changed to upon startup. Okay, so let's do a cleanup. Let's delete a couple of those, those two containers that we built. Now we have a little bit of fun here. Um, what we're going to do is build a container from scratch, because if we know the constructs around a container, we can build one from scratch. So what I'm gonna do, is run a container, just spin that up. What I need it to do is unpack all its layers so I can get access to its root directory. Make sure it's running. Yep, status of up, all looks good. And then let's have a look at the logs. If we say Docker logs, we'll have a look and we can have a look at, hey, that's the SQL Server error log. So let's have a look at that. Make sure the container's up. Oh, never mind, I'm jumping ahead. So I've stopped that container. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong command, my bad. So I'll stop that container. What I can do now is export that container to a tar file using this command, docker export. Now I've already done this because it can take a little bit of time. And then I can extract that to a directory. Again, I've already done it. But if we list there, we've got the root of our container in this location, ls SQL Server. I have to do ls here. There we go. There's the export. And there's it, there's it extracted. So I've added a little file here to prove that when we spin up the container, we're actually using this location as the root. If I start this container again and run docker exec ls, there we go. All right, it's a little bit difficult to see because I'm zoomed in here, but the bin boot dev exec, see bin boot dev exec. Now that's the root of the container. So we've managed to extract that out to our file system. If I just delete it now, we don't need it. Let's navigate to some of my code. And what I'm gonna do here is if I open this up, container from scratch, main.go. Now I am not a Go programmer in any way, shape or form. So please bear with me here. But we'll have a look at this. This is just a load of Go code. And this is from Liz Rice's containers from scratch session. If you haven't checked that, I'll have the link for it at the end, but do go and check it out because she'll explain it a lot better than I do. <laughs> but I've changed it a little bit to get it working for SQL Server. So the main one here is this function run. What we're doing down here is this is where we set our namespaces for our container. And if we come down here a little bit, we are going to rename our container host name to container. And we're going to change the root of the container to that file system we just extracted from our running container. So to home, DBA from the cold, SQL Server. Then we're going to change it, do a load of mounts. 
And then down here is where we set our control groups. So for each, I'm going to set two control groups, one for memory and one for CPU, limiting the memory to two gig and limiting CPUs to two. OK, so we have that code there. What I'm going to do is open a term X session and come down here and just do this. That's not what I wanted. Control B. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is run that code. And what this should do is spin up our container from scratch, and there we go. Look, we've run into our, we've gone into our container that we've built from scratch. I can check the root directory. There we go. The root was changed when we jumped into it to that location we specified. There we go. We got high DBA from the code there, and then the rest of everything. Okay, let's get SQL running in this container then. I can check the host name, which we already did. There we go, container. I need to create this new random file, which I've already done. It's a special file that SQL needs in order to spin up. And I'm saying thank you very much to Mark Wilkinson here for actually helping me when I was building this. I couldn't get SQL to spin up for love nor money. And he points out, how about this file here, this new random file? Created that new random file. And SQL came up. And there it is. Okay. So now let's create our container. Let's spin up a container in the background. So this is where the binary is, opt MS SQL bin SQL server. And I'm just outputting everything to null. I don't want any output. I want to run this in the background. So there we go. And then we should be able to check the processes in the container. There we go. We should get two SQL instances maybe. But there it is, SQL server up and running in our container from scratch. When you get two. No, OK, just the one. Hmm. Let's check the processes on the host. Uh, <laughs> why is that not jumping down? So I'm not very good at using. Let's check the processes on the host, shall we? Come on, let's do it through this. And I'll just jump between the two. There we go. OK. Processes on the host. There we go. Now we've got two SQL Server processes running as root because I'm running as root. If we come back here and do PS orc, there we go. We have our two SQL Server processes. So if I come back here, let's have a look at the control groups location. We can see we've got SQL Server there and there. So let's see if we can grab memory limit. There we go. Excellent stuff. So that's our control group that we created in our code to limit the memory available to our container. So we've obviously got a namespace, the UTS namespace, that's changed the host name of the container. And we've got our control groups in there as well. And we've changed the root of the container to that location that we extracted. So we've got the three things. There we've got our control groups, our namespaces, and we've changed the root. And we can see the CPU limit in there as well. So. What I'll do is I'm going to bin this connection. There we go. And stay on the host here. So I wouldn't recommend this isn't production worthy in any way, shape, or form. But it's just showing you that if you know the constructs behind how containers are set up, you can use just a little bit of Go code and spin up your own container and see the constructs in place, changing the root, the namespaces, and the control groups. OK. So that is container isolation. Now let's have a look at something else. Let's go and have a look at container networking. So if we have a look at a Docker host, we will see three networks here by default. We have a default bridge network, which is the default network. If you ever spin up a container and don't specify a network, this is where your container, this is the network that your container goes on to. It's represented by the Docker zero network if you have a look at IPA. There we go. That's our default bridge network there. We have host, which pretty much does exactly what it says on the tin. It effectively removes the isolation between the containers networking stack and the host networking stack. And then we have none, as in disable networking completely. No, the only way you can get into it is to exec in 
and you can have a really isolated environment where you can do your work and then you can jump out of it when you've finished and blow your container away. Now, let's have a look at that default bridge network. So if I do Docker network inspect bridge, you see we get a whole bunch of information. We've got our subnet, we've got our gateway, and we can see here containers, nothing. We have no containers running there. So let's run two SQL containers on that default bridge network. Now, notice here, I'm just saying Docker container run. I'm not mapping any ports whatsoever. So no dash dash publish, no dash P, nothing. We're just going to spin these containers up and I'm running them from a custom image, which is my custom SQL 2019 tools image. And all this has is things like ping installed that aren't in the actual official Microsoft SQL Server images. So they're also available on my GitHub. Don't worry about it. They're just there so I can basically execute ping. <laughs> okay, so we've got our containers up. Let's make sure they're running. There they are, 20 seconds. And then now let's have a look at that bridge network again. There we go. This time in containers, we have our two, SQL container one, SQL container two, with their IP addresses. And I can grab them because I haven't mapped any ports. The only way I'm gonna be able to connect to those containers is by grabbing their IP addresses. So I can use this Docker and Spec command, grab their IP addresses. And now let's try and ping one of those containers from the other one using its name. So I'm executing into SQL container one, but I'm gonna ping SQL container four. It doesn't work. The default bridge network that Docker offers does not support mapping container names to IP addresses. So we can use the IP address, no problem. That's no problem. They can communicate with each other via IP address, no problem at all, but they can't use container names to communicate with each other. There's no DNS resolution. What I can do is use that IP address as I would with a SQL CLI and do things like run select at that version. So I can Connect to it, no problem using the IP addresses. You just need to grab that IP address first. So it's not great. So let's blow that away. And if I know their IP addresses, what I can do is add in this little flag here, add host, SQL container two, and its IP address. What this is going to do is write an entry into the host file, which will allow me to use container names for containers to talk to each other on the default network. There we go. Spun those two up. Well, there we go. And now, because I've written into the hosting file, we can ping each other using the host. Now, let's run two more containers. And this time, let's do some port mapping. This is probably what everyone's seen when they run a container. We use dash dash publish or dash p, and we map some ports on the host to ports in the container. Now, with these port numbers, I'm just picking these out of thin air. I just need a port on the host that's not going to be in use. So 15789 and 15799, pretty much guaranteed they're not going to be in use on the host. So let's run those. And I can use Docker port and I can view those port mappings. And it'll tell me here. So 1433 within the container, mapped to 15789 on the host. And for the second one, 1433 within the container, mapped to 15799 on the host. And all that means is any connection hitting the host on that port will automatically be mapped to the 1433 port on the container and we'll be able to talk to say SQL Server. And we can see that here by using localhost and the port number. So if I do that, we will get our connection routed through from the host into our container. And there we go, I can connect to SQL and run a query. Okie dokie, let's blow away those four containers. Now, the default bridge network, yeah, it's fairly good. There's been pretty much everyone spins up there. But what we can do is create a custom bridge network. Now, Docker provides a whole bunch of drivers for us to create our networks for. We have what we the three we saw earlier. We have bridge, a host, and null. There's also Mac VLAN where you can actually assign a Mac address to your um, container. So it appears as a physical device on the network. And there's overlay. An overlay is used for things like it's allowed Docker daemons to connect to each other across hosts. It's used in Docker Swarm. But if we just create a Docker network create and give it a name and list our networks, what it'll do is it will create a user-defined bridge network for us. And user-defined bridge networks have one major advantage over the default bridge network, which I'll show now. So let's spin up two custom 
new two containers on the custom network. And there it is, network SQL Server. So let's spin that up, these two up. Even. One and two. Excellent. Let's check that they're there. Boom. We can ping containers by name on custom bridge networks because Docker does actually have a DNS server. It just doesn't support DNS resolution on the default bridge network, but it does on user-defined bridge networks. And if you have a look at the um, DNS settings of one of our containers, we can see the name server there, and that is the location of the Docker DNS server. So that's one major advantage of using user-defined networks is that the containers can talk to each other via their container names. You don't have to go in and add, add things into their host file or stuff like that. We can just do it by default. It's really handy. Um, I was setting up testing replication once, and I needed a load of containers to talk to each other via replication. And I had to create a user-defined bridge network for them to be able to talk to each other via their container name. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, okay, doing great for time. So I'm gonna blow these containers away and I'm gonna blow my network away, reset everything. So that is a little bit more about container networking. How do you use a user-defined bridge network to get containers talking to each other? All righty, let's go on to the next subject, which is for us SQL Server folks, probably one of the most important topics, persisting our data. How can we persist our data from one container to another in Docker? Now, there are three different ways of doing this. First one is something called bind mounts or mounting volumes from the host, which I'm not going to cover because I don't particularly like it because you're putting an external dependency on a container. If you deployed that container somewhere else and the files went on the host, that container's not going to run. So I'm not going to talk about bind mounts. The only time I think they do come in handy is if you want to run a really large database in a container, and you've got the files on the host. But if you're running a really large database in the container, or if you want to run a really large database in a container, I really would think about why you're using containers. There maybe a normal instance of SQL would be the way forward. But the two methods I do want to talk about when it comes to persisting data for SQL Server in Docker containers are named volumes and data volume containers. So let's have a look at named volumes first. All name volumes are, are creating volumes within Docker itself. So we say Docker volume create and we give it a name. Let's call it SQL Server. And then we can verify our name volume is there by Docker volume ls. And there is our name volume. So now I can create a container with that volume mapped. So what I'm going to do here is map SQL Server, my name volume, to var opt SQL Server within my container. So let's run that container. There we go. And let's make sure it's running. Yeah. There we go. Up, status of, status of up, up about four seconds. Let's get a little bit longer. There we go. OK. So now what I can do is I can create a database on that map location, var op SQL Server, and var op SQL Server there as well. Aha. Okay, I've had an error there. The reason I've had that error is because even though I've got that var op SQL server location supported by a name volume, SQL doesn't have access to that location. Remember in these 2019 containers, SQL runs as a custom user. It doesn't run as root, it runs as MS SQL. So we need to grant that user access to that location. If you have a look at it here, SQL server, it's the root user running it. Which MS, so MS SQL user won't have access to. So let's go ahead and not do that. <laughs> let's go ahead and change the owner of that location to the MS SQL user. So if we have a look at it now. There we go. SQL is the owner. So now I should be able to create that database. No problem. SQL has access to it. Let's see if we can create some files in that location. And this time my command has completed successfully. Okay, let's see if our database is there. I'm selecting name from sys databases against my container, and there is my test database. Okay, so we have created a custom database in our container. Let's now blow that container away. So I'm saying Docker container RM, and this just selects all containers that are running on the host. We've only got the one, and then F to force it. You can't, you have to force when you want to delete a running container. So 
Let's confirm that container is gone. It's definitely gone. But we still have our name volume. So that means I can spin up another container, mapping that volume again, and I should be able to get my database back. Let's confirm that container is running. Yeah, all good. OK. So this time, I don't need to change the owner to MS SQL. Those data changes will persist. I can check my data files are there as well. There they are. MS SQL user is still the owner. So let's go ahead and let's recreate that database. There we go. Excellent stuff. So we've managed to persist our database from one container to another by using a named volume. We can confirm the database is there. And there it is. Fantastic. So by using that name volume, we create a database in one container, blew that container away, and then we create a new container with that volume mapped, and we were able to recreate our database. Okay, let's clean up and let's blow all that away. Do I really want to be having to run create database for attach every time I spin up a new container with a volume mapped? Would it be nicer if the volumes were autom if the databases were automatically there when I created my new container? So let's create two new name volumes called MS SQL system and MS SQL user. There they are. Okay. And this time we're going to create a container and we're going to map our MS SQL system name volume to var opt MS SQL. Now, under var opt MS SQL is the data folder. And in that data folder are where the system databases live, specifically the master database. By persisting this location, when we create a database, an entry for that, uh, when we create a database, an entry for that database will be created in the master database. So if we persist both the master database and our user databases and use those name volumes in a new container, when SQL spins up, it will look at the master database and go, oh, I've got a database in this location and automatically attach that user database to our new container. Exactly the same as normal SQL works. When SQL starts up, it looks at the master database and goes, oh, I've got databases here, 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 here. All the databases come online. So let's spin up a container. You might notice here, so let's talk about this. I'm using environment variables here to set the MS SQL data and log default locations to var op SQL Server, which is going to be supported by our name volume. So there we go. Let's create that. Okie dokie. And let's check that container's running. Up two seconds. Let's give it a little second to make sure SQL comes up. Can take about 10 seconds. Oh yeah, that'll be good enough. Okay. I still have to change the owner of that location to MS SQL. And now let's create a database. And I don't, I can just say create database, test database two, because I use those environment variables to set the default data and log locations to our custom location. And we can confirm that. Let's make sure the database is there. Yeah, excellent stuff. And then we can check the file locations as well with X running SP help file. And there we go. There's our test database two, and it is in our custom location. Excellent. Okay. I can view the files as well. And look, we've got the MS SQL as you. Brilliant. OK, no messing around. Let's get rid of that container. Nope. Confirm. Yep, no containers running. Well, I still have my volumes. So now let's spin up another container remapping our name volumes, MS SQL system and MS SQL user. There we go. Okay. And because we've now mapped where the master database lived, if we run this, fingers crossed, boom, there is our custom database. So by persisting the master database location and our user database location, we can persist a database from one container to another 
and it'll automatically be mapped into our new container. We don't have to do any other scripting. You don't have to, like we did in the first example, say create database for attach. It will just automatically be there by using name volumes underneath the master database location and our user database location. Okay. All right, so that is named volumes. Now I wanna very quickly have a look at data volume containers. Now, all data volume containers are, well, a container with a load of data volumes on. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say Docker container create, not run, just create a container with a name of data store. And it's gonna have all these volumes in it. And it's built from a custom image here. Now, the reason it's built from a custom image, and we'll go through that in a second, is because, uh, I need to be able to grant it access, grant the MS SQL user access to the locations I'm going to build. Otherwise, we'll get that same error that we got initially with SQL cannot access this location. So I had to build a custom image for that. It's not that one. And that's all that is. It Basically, this has a whole bunch of locations in it that have granted access to the MS SQL user. So let's create that. And there we go. we've had a look at the Docker file, we have a look at it again. All it did was create a load of directories and then grant SQL access to it. We can verify that container. There it is. Let's look at status, status of created. It's not running, it's just sitting there because all I'm going to do is grab the volumes that it's created. All the data volume container does is create name volumes in the background. So it's pretty much name volumes. The only difference from this is if you have a lot of volumes you want to map into a container, when you spin up your SQL container, instead of specifying every single volume that you want, you can just say volumes from data store. And so I'm going to spin up a container here, doing the usual, and then set in my default data log and backup directory. So let's just spin that up. There we go. Confirm my container's running. There we go, got my data volume container and my SQL container. And this time let's create a database called test database three. Might, that might've been too quick, SQL up. There we go, great stuff. Confirm my database is there. Excellent stuff. Okay, let's confirm the locations of the files. We use those environment variables to set the default data and log locations to, yes, there we go this location and that location, which are supported by the volumes from our data store. Let's blow that container away, no messing around, same as usual, exactly the same as before. Our container's gone, but we still have our data volume container. And that means we still have our volumes. So now we can spin up another container saying volumes from data store. There we go. Give it a few seconds. There we go. How long? Seven seconds, should be long enough. And let's see if our database is there. There it is. <laughs> so by using a data volume container, we have created a load of name volumes and then mapped them from a blown away container to another container. And we've retained the data changes that we made in the initial container, basically creating that database. And it's now available for us in our new container. So that is how to use name volumes and data volume containers to persist data changes from one container to another. Are we doing on time? Loads of time. Okay, great. Okay, so now let's have a look at custom images. Now, we kind of briefly went over this with the data volume containers image. We had a Docker file on the host. But what is a Docker file? Well, all a Docker file is, is a file on my host that contains a load of commands that when executed will build me a custom image. And that's all it is. Just telling Docker, hey, do this, do this, do this, build a custom image. So let's have a look at our Docker file. I won't do it in here. What I'll do is I'll take it out and go here. Right, here is a Docker file. Bring this down, really simple. We're starting off saying from this image. So we're basing our custom image off an existing image. In this case, Microsoft SQL Server 2019 
CU5 Ubuntu 18.4. Then I am switching to the root user and creating a loader directory. So var ops SQL server, and then SQL data, SQL log, SQL backups under that location. Then I am changing the owner of those locations to the MS SQL user, switching to the MS SQL user, and starting up SQL Server. So that means we'll get basically exactly the same as the 2019 CU5 image, but with a load of custom directories that SQL has access to, and SQL will be running as the MS SQL user. So we can go ahead and build that image by saying Docker build me an image, dash T, tag it with a name. I'm going to call this custom image one and then dot. And all dot is saying is in this location, look for a file called Docker file. So let's build that image. So we can see Docker is now stepping through each one of those instructions in the Docker file and building me my custom image. So it's now creating our directories, changing the owner of the directory, switching to the MS SQL user, and then starting up SQL Server. OK. So we should have our image there. There it is, custom image one. Let's create a load of name volumes, same as we did in the last demo. We got our volumes. And now let's run our container. What we're doing here is mapping all our name volumes to the locations that we created, setting the default data and log backups locations, setting the end user license agreement, SA password, giving it a name, and then we're going to build this container from our custom image. So let's build that. Hey, OK. Right. So we're running our container. Let's make sure it's running. There it is. And now let's have a look at permissions on those folders. Because we built this container from a custom image where we'd already set the permissions, I don't need to manually go in and change the permissions of those folders like we did in the initial demos. We had to we create all those custom locations, but before we could create a database, and then we had to grant the MS SQL user access. We don't need to do that here. We've already done it in our Docker file. So now I can just go ahead and say, create database, test database, and it will create it in our locations because we've given SQL access and we've set the default data and log locations. We can confirm our databases there. There we go. And there's our test database. And we have a look at the locations. Confirm there it is, var ops SQL server, SQL data, var ops SQL server, SQL log. The settings we deployed with the environment variables, setting those default data and log locations, and they're supported by our name volumes. So we could blow away that container, same as we did in the last demos. Confirm that container is gone. And then let's spin up a container again, remapping those name volumes. Okay, I'm going to confirm that container is running. There we go. Give it 10 seconds or so. There we are. That's the magic number. Okay, and let's have a look to see if that database is there. There we go. Okay, so by using a custom image that has custom locations for our database files that already has granted the MS SQL user access to them. We don't have to manually go in and fix stuff. We can just create our databases, blow our container away when we're finished with it. Then we want to spin up another one and our databases will be there ready to go for us. We'll persist them from one container to another. We don't have to worry about anything manual. It's all done for us, not a problem. So let's get rid of that container, that and that image, we don't need it do a bit of a cleanup here. OK, um, we're good for time. So let's have a look at another image. Let's go a little bit nuts. So here we go. In this directory, I've got attachedDB.sh file, a Docker file, and two database files. Let's have a look at that Docker file. What we're going to do here is build SQL from scratch. So if we come in here and we go down, and let's make sure I'm not, yep, there we go. OK. Let's have a look at this Docker file. Now, this is a little bit more involved, so let's go through what we're doing here. We're starting off from the Ubuntu 18.04 image. That's when we're starting off from. We're going to have a label here just saying, hey, DBA from the cold is the person who built this image. We're going to create the MS SQL user, which has the same 
ID as usual as the user. I mean, technically, you don't really need to do this because when you install SQL, it'll create it for you. But I like to do things manually, so there it is. And then we're in installing SQL Server, and this is just the exact same instructions from installing SQL Server on Linux. So I'm installing a load of dependencies, adding a key, adding the repository, installing SQL. And then we do the same thing with the SQL Server tools, adding the repository, updating our repositories, and then installing the tools there. Now, then we're going to create a load of directories, same as before, SQL Server data, log, and backups, copy some database files into those directories, and our attached db.sh script, setting our permissions, making our attached db script executable, and then because I don't like typing them out every single time I want to run a container, I'm going to set a whole bunch of environment variables here. So accepting the end user license agreement, setting the addition to SQL, enabling the agent, and setting the default data log and backup directories. Then I'm switching to the MS SQL user. And then I'm running a script to attach the databases and then starting SQL Server, which is a bit odd. Why am I running a script to attach databases? and then start in SQL. Won't that attach script fail? Because SQL's not running. Well, if we have a look at that attach script, it's a little trick when it comes to doing things like this, running scripts in containers. The first thing that script does is wait for 20 seconds. It doesn't do anything. Wait 20 seconds and then creates our database from the database files that we've copied into the container. Now, the reason it does this is because containers always need a running process as their main process. If this script was its main process, the container would spin up, execute this script, and the script would complete, and the container would shut down. So by doing it this way around, our container script, this script starts up, waits 20 seconds, which is about enough time for SQL to spin up, and then it attaches the database. But SQL stays as the main process within the container, which means SQL stays running, the container doesn't shut down. So that's a nice little trick to run scripts against a SQL instance and not have your container shut down immediately. And it took me longer than I'd like to admit how to work that out. But anyway, let's have a look at this in action. So we've got all of our scripts. We build a custom image. Now I've already done this because we're installing SQL from scratch. So it takes quite a long time. But if we have a look here, here is the custom image. So what I can do is have a look at this image as well. I can do Docker image inspect and I can pull out a whole load of stuff here. What I can do is to see, see things like the environment variables, which is also a really good reason for not putting your SA password as an environment variable in your Docker file because people can come in and they can easily see it. We can also have a look at the history of the image as well. If we grab this and do history, order it, we can see this is all the stuff from the Ubuntu image. If we come further up, we can start seeing the steps in our Docker file. So we've got the label here, adding the user, installing SQL and installing SQL Server tools, setting our directories, copying file from there setting our directories, copying our files in, changing the owner, making the script executable, and then setting our environment variables, switching to the MS SQL user, and then starting up SQL. So let's go ahead and let's run a container from this custom image. So I'm saying Docker container run, publish some flags, set my SA password, don't need to do any other environment variables that are already in the Docker file, give a container a name, and from custom image to. There we go. OK. Now, let's check that container is running. Now, remember, that script is going to wait about 20 seconds. So we're going to have to wait 20 seconds for that database to be attached. I will say, out of all the demos that I'm doing here, if any of them are going to fall over, it's going to be this one. Um, it, the attached script isn't the most um, also reliable thing in the world. So I wouldn't really recommend it when you're building your own custom images. The reason it's in here is just to show you what you can do with a Docker file. So is that 20 seconds? That's 20 seconds. OK, let's see if that database is there. Fingers crossed. 
Okay, something's gone wrong. Let's have a look. We'll give it a few more seconds to see if that. No. Okay, there we are. No, I literally ran this 10 minutes before the session started. It worked absolutely fine. And now it seems to have keeled over. So our database isn't there. If we went if we went into the let's jump into the container. What's the name of the container? Docker container ls. Okay. So Docker exec dash it. SQL container three. Oh, bash. All right, come here. Var opt SQL server. Ls. Let's see if this will work. Run the script manually in the. So it's going to still going to wait twenty seconds, but then it should go ahead and attach our database. Not great. It should have done this automatically, but as I said, it's not the most reliable in the world. Uh, so. Probably not best disappearing scripts. I'm just showing it here to show you what you can do with scripts and Docker files and things like that, building stuff from scratch. There we go. Huh. Okay. There we go. That looks like it's worked. Let's have a look at it now. There we go. There's our database. So that's what we should have got. The script should have kicked in, run, and we should have had our database attached automatically. But that's just an example of what you can do with custom images. You can do some really cool stuff with all the uh, building from scratch, installing SQL from scratch. So you don't have to just take the images that Microsoft give us. You can build your own image. You can build it from your own Linux image. You can get it patched and up to date. Then you can install SQL, create all your directories, set your permissions, and then set your environment variables if you always run with it, run like developer edition and enable the agent and your default data and log backup. So you can do these really cool things all in your custom Docker files. OK, so let's clean up. Let's get rid of that. And I'm going to delete that image as well. OK. Oh, no, I needed last one. OK, so the last set of demos we have is something called Docker Compose. And I'll tell you what, I'll come here as well. Compose, compose is a tool for running, <laughs> excuse me, running Docker containers. Now, when I first looked at Compose, I thought it was only for running multi-container applications. When you want to spin up a load of containers, Docker Compose is the way to go forward. And I couldn't see the point in using it for just spinning up one container until I went to DockerCon and I was talking to a load of the Docker captains there. And I was talking to them about Docker Compose. And I said, no, I just thought it was always for just, you know, single uh, multi-container applications. And the, one of the captains would say, no, 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 no. We use Docker Compose for everything, even just spinning up one container. And there's a good reason for that. And let's have a look at this. So let's have a look at this container run statement. So we're combining everything we've talked about today. So we've got Docker container run. That should be Docker container run, actually. Typo. Ah, there we go. We're going to publish some flags. We're going to set a whole bunch of environment variables. We're going to have a custom network. We're going to have a load of volumes. We're going to specify the name and then the image that container is going to be run from. That's what, 50 lines of code? It's a lot of code. Do we really want to be typing that out every single time we want to run a container? Now, OK, you could drop that into a bash file and just execute your bash file. But there's got to be a better way. And thankfully, Composes that better way. If we have a look in this directory, come here. We have a Docker compose file, a Docker file, and a SQL Server environment variable file. So if I look at the Docker file, I won't do it in here. I will come down, not here, compose, Docker file. Here we go. Very simple Docker file. It's the same as the custom image one we just built a few minutes ago. So from CU 5 2019 image, creating a whole load of directories, changing the owner of those directories to the MS SQL user, and then spinning SQL up as that MS SQL user. We have a look at the environment variable file. We have, I know I've got my SA pass within an environment variable file, but don't do this, but it's just a demo, so it doesn't really matter. But I've got my SA pass within there accepting my end user license agreement, enabling the agent, and then specifying my data log and backup directories. So get rid of that. And then finally, 
I have my Docker Compose YAML file. So we have a version up here. Services, this is where we specify our container. We have a container, we're going to call it SQL Server 1. It's going to be built from this Docker file. We're going to map some ports. So we're going to have port 15789 to 1433 in the container. Specify an environment variable file and then listing the volumes that we want. So, get rid of that. If we come back here, let's have a look at the networks on the host. We've only got the defaults. We don't have any name volumes. And if we check the images, I got all my custom images, the Ubuntu image, and then the CU, oh, I've got 12 there, CU5 and CU12. Okay. So now, because I'm in this location, I can just say, Docker compose up dash D, run my container in the background, demonize it. And you can see that it's created my custom network, it's created my volumes, and now it's building me my custom image. So everything we've talked about today, custom images, networks, persisting data, can all be combined into one simple .yaml file. And we have that one little command there, instead of that 15 line monstrosity that we'd have to run every single time. So if we have a look now, we can check the networks on the host and we have a custom network for our container. We have a whole bunch of volumes. We have our custom image that it built for us. And we have our container as well, up to 30 seconds. And I can jump, I can create a database in that container. Don't have to mess around because we're building from that custom image where we created custom locations and we granted SQL access to them. And we can check that here by, there we go. The MS SQL user has access. And we can check our databases there. There we go. And then if I get tired of all of this, I can just say Docker compose down. What that'll do is it'll shut the container down, get rid of it. It'll get rid of our network, but it will keep our custom image and it will keep our volumes. So if you check the networks, network is gone, container is gone, but we have our volumes and we have our custom image. So I could spin this back up, spin up a new container, all the network, network would be recreated, the volumes would be reattached, and I'd have my database there back as it was. Okay, so we've got a few minutes towards the end. That's pretty much everything. What I'm going to do is do a little bit tidy up here, and I've got some resources for you now as well. So let's have a look. Where's me? Resources folder. There it is. Okay. So I get rid of that and that. So my contact details are here. If you have any questions after today, please feel free to reach out. I'm at DBA from the cold on Twitter, or if you need, you are more than welcome to email me as well, DBA from the cold at gmail.com. Here is the repo for my session. And then there's the slides for the sessions when, when I do this with slides. I've got a summary of all the blogs I've written about SQL Server and containers up there, summary of my container series. I've actually written a guide called the SQL Server and Containers Guide, which is published on GitHub, which contains all the stuff we've been talking about today and much more. So you're more than welcome to check that out. And then we've got Liz Rice's Containers from Scratch session. If you really want to know how containers work, I highly recommend you check out that session. It's absolutely fantastic. And then finally, we've got the Installing SQL Server on Linux guide as well. That's the official Microsoft Docs. It's what I dropped into that big, long, um, Docker file that we tried to build for the second one that went horribly wrong with the database didn't work. But that's all the information there. Thank you so much. Thank you.